Okay, so hello and welcome to another episode of the ICC Academy COVID-19 Briefing, an interactive video series where we explore the economic and health implications of this coronavirus pandemic and what must be done to ensure successful recovery for businesses big and small. I'm your host, Thomas Paris, and in this episode, we will discuss how the international, private, and public sector research is working together across the world to find timely solutions to tackle COVID-19. As you know, these briefings showcase our collaboration between the ICC and our many global partners from private and the public sector, during the session, we will start by running through a few topics followed by an audience Q&A. So we invite you to send your questions in the chat and we'll go through them together near the end. So Daphne, over to you. Thank you, Thomas. Hello, everybody. My name is Daphne yong Deve. I'm Director of Peace and Prosperity at ICC. Really glad that you're able to join us today. The whole world is currently living in the hope that an effective treatment of vaccine against COVID-19 will be developed soon. It has been said that researchers are among some of the most important people on the planet today. The global research community has really stepped up in a remarkable way to work on diagnostics and vaccines. With public and private sector scientists around the globe working hand in hand at unprecedented speed. But what exactly is the status of the research today? And how does the global research ecosystem work to deliver solutions? What are the challenges that lie ahead and what needs to be done to make sure that this crucial ecosystem remains ready to tackle the global health challenges that we will face in the future? To share their insights on these questions, we have with us extremely eminent people who are at the very heart of the global research effort. So I'm very honored to introduce Thomas Quaney, Director General of IFPMA, which is the global association of research-based biopharmaceutical companies. Thomas, you also chair several committees in industry, APEC and OECD, relating to global health, cancer care, and antimicrobial resistance. You were previously Secretary General of Interpharma, the Swiss Pharmaceutical Association, and before that, a journalist and a Swiss diplomat. And finally, Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, who is Chief Scientist of the World Health Organization, the UN agency responsible for international health, and previously also as De Deputy Director General for Programs. In India, you have also been Secretary to the Government for Health Research and Director General of the Indian Council of Medical Research. You are also yourself a globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and HIV. So, Sumya, as Chief Scientist of WHO, which is coordinating the global response to the pandemic and providing data and advice to the whole world, you are at the very heart of the research effort with tests, treatments and vaccines against COVID-19. Can you tell us, what is the current state of research? Who is doing this research? And how are all these different actors coordinating and working together? And what exactly is WHO's role in this? Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and your question. I hope I'm audible. Um, yes. Great. Um, so greetings to everyone who's online and listening. Um, I'm the chief scientist here at the World Health Organization, and we've been involved right from the beginning of this epidemic, pandemic, um, in, in, in different ways. And I, I'll give you a few examples. Um, Right at the beginning of January, when we realized that there was this new clinical syndrome that was reported from China, and, and shortly thereafter, we had the genetic sequence of the first few viral genomes that was made available through Gisade, and Peter's going to speak more to that very, very early on. We started engaging with our networks of scientists, researchers, um, academics, regulatory experts, and um, clinicians in countries around the world 
And why and how were we able to do this? It's because we were already set up through something that we call the R&D blueprint that was created by the WHO after the West Africa Ebola outbreak when it was realized that a lack of global preparedness and coordination for research on priority pathogens, the kind of pathogens that can cause these big epidemics and pandemics actually resulted in a very inefficient way of going about research, which did not lead to the development of any new products, you know, despite the fact that there was this huge Ebola outbreak in West Africa, that there were many people interested in doing research. In fact, many research groups were operating in those countries, and yet the end result was not satisfactory. And so the WHO then created the blueprint, which firstly identified the pathogens that need that the world needs to focus on because they were neglected. They don't have a market um, um, value for any of these products. And therefore, the R&D on these is, is uh, there's no, not much investment. And, and these are pathogens uh, like Ebola, of course, but also Lassa fever, uh, the Nipah virus, the MERS uh, coronavirus, um, and a number of other viruses that cause hemorrhagic fevers. And it included in the list something called pathogen X. So pathogen X was supposed to be the next big viral um, path, a virus that could cause potentially a pandemic. It could be influenza, but it, it could be other things. So it was called pathogen X. And, and it's because that we had this platform, we had the networks, we had a framework to, to proceed immediately. As soon as we heard about potentially a new pathogen, okay, what do we need to do? How do we get organized? in terms of um, diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, but also in terms of learning about the epidemiology of this disease, the transmission, the animal reservoir, the, um, the, uh, the mode of spread. Uh, how, can you, how can healthcare workers protect themselves? What are the social and behavioral science questions? What are the ethical issues? And so we created a number of working groups that have been meeting virtually. We met once physically in February in Geneva. It was a huge research and innovation forum that had about 400 scientists um, participating. But then we've had hundreds more participate virtually through the working groups. So we have a good plan, a research roadmap that was published early in March that sort of sets out what the top research questions are, what the knowledge gaps are. So that was so that's part of WHO's normative function is to convene the world's best experts and to come out with guidance. In this case, it's guidance on what research is needed. Another whole pillar has been really in coordinating some of the research um, that needs to get done. And I can give you a couple of examples. We, we have a landscape document that we update on therapeutics and vaccines and diagnostics um, that, that tells us what all is, is coming down the pipeline. And we also have a committee that looks at prioritizing which ones should go further into clinical trials. Um, and they look at criteria of efficacy and safety, potentially, but also other things like the affordability, the access, you know, the manufacturing capacity, and so on. And, and then we have all our normative pieces of work, which sit across WHO and the technical departments, which actually take the products of research and synthesize the research evidence in order to generate guidelines, whether the guidelines are on treatment or on prevention, or uh, infection prevention, or you know, um, there are more public health measures. The guidelines are all based on the evidence, which of course we all know is moving at high speed. Today we have something like 400 to 1,000 publications almost on a daily basis on COVID-19. So it's quite a big job to synthesize all of that, stay on top of it, and have the sort of systematic reviews and living guidelines, which continuously adapt and update based on advancing knowledge. And finally, we are coordinating the solidarity trial for therapeutics. And then the reason for doing that is important. WHO doesn't normally coordinate or conduct research, but the reason for doing that was the fact that we saw again, the danger of fragmentation of research efforts, multiple small clinical trials that don't give you the answers you need. And therefore we decided to focus on, you know, the, the currently available repurposed drugs, looking at endpoints of mortality the important public health endpoints of mortality and reduction in the need for ventilation and critical care. 
And this trial is currently enrolling in about 20 countries, but there are at least another 30 countries that are waiting to, to start enrollment as soon as they get through their regulatory procedures. So great example of global collaboration coming together very, very quickly. Uh, this trial started literally in a matter of a couple of weeks of getting the protocol ready. And we've enrolled about uh, close to 3,000 patients now, but it's going to continue uh, because we want to enroll enough patients to be able to answer these questions definitively. Back to you. Yeah, so, Somia, um, I'm sure some people need to know, uh, you know, what are the chances are of a vaccine or treatment in the short term? Well, we, we, we have to be optimistic. The good thing is, if you look at vaccines, there are over 100 and the numbers are growing every day uh, in preclinical development and at least eight candidates in phase one, some in phase two. So I think it's unprecedented that first of all, you had this huge uh, interest in developing a vaccine, uh, both from the big, large research manufacturers, as well as small biotech companies and academic labs. And this is all around the world. It's not limited to a couple of countries. So that gives us hope that some of these vaccine candidates, and we have them in all different platforms, we have inactivated uh, viruses, we have protein subunit vaccines, and we have these very new DNA and RNA vaccine platforms, which have never been used in human beings before. So there's an exciting array of platform technologies as well as of potential vaccine candidates. And let's hope that some of them turn out to be safe and efficacious. In terms of drugs, I think antiviral drugs is always a challenge. And uh, we're testing a couple of uh, drugs now, as you know, in the solidarity trial and in the recovery trial um, and the NIAID's trial on remdesivir. Um, we're still awaiting for the results of these studies, but um, there are also monoclonal antibodies that are coming down the pipeline. And I think monoclonals do have potential both for treatment and prevention of infection. The question there is going to be scale and access to those monoclonals if they are found to be effective. But um, there's, there's a huge amount of uh, research going on, which is excellent, and which gives me hope that hope that we will find treatments and vaccines for this. WHO recently launched something called the COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. This is a landmark global collaboration between the public and private sector to accelerate the development, production and equitable global access to new COVID-19 essential health technologies. And IFPMA was one of its founding partners. Sumya, through what challenges WHO is trying to address through this initiative and what it is hoping to achieve? Uh, Sumya, I think you might be muted. Yeah, I was muted. So okay, good. We talk about all the research that's going on and the fact that everyone is trying their best to develop a vaccine, develop new drugs. But you know, that's not going to be enough. You could have someone develop a vaccine and yet not have any impact on this pandemic. If the vaccine cannot be scaled, it cannot be uh, affordably accessed by populations around the world who, who need it. And so the reason for launching this sort of accelerator, uh, the, what, what you referred to, the ACT accelerator, which, is, which stands for Access to COVID Tools, with a large number of partners from around the world that includes heads of state, that includes the, the big philanthropic foundations, and that includes private sector, it includes of course, WHO and the other multilateral agencies, um, and through them all the networks, is really to ensure access. So the principles that are really underlying this uh, partnership are equitable access. So it's not only to design and develop these new tools, but you have to ensure affordability and create the conditions for broad and rapid scale up. The second principle is collaboration versus competition. Um, the kind of market forces that we are used to seeing is really a very competitive field where people try to, to create a molecule that, you know, that would have a, not only a large market, but that would be the first in class and the first in place to get regulatory approval. And that's what excludes others from having that advantage. So here we're saying we need 
multiple tools. Probably one vaccine is not going to be sufficient. It would be good to have four or five vaccines with different characteristics to suit you know, different uh, population needs. And also collaboration on sharing of knowledge. For example, we run a network that looks at animal models and assays. And everybody around the world has been openly sharing uh, their advances that they're making in their labs. So that very quickly, within a matter of two months, we now have like the standards set for what the animal models could be to test new vaccines and drugs. So that's just an example of collaboration versus competition. The third is transparency, transparency to everyone, to the public, to civil society, because a lot of the money that's being spent on R&D now is public funds, is taxpayer money. And we need to be able to be very transparent about how and why that's being spent in the ways it is. As you know, $8 billion was pledged on the 4th of May by a number of countries to support the accelerator. And the fourth principle is being evidence-based, being rational. And this is where organizations like WHO and others who synthesize evidence and come up with guidelines and standards that ensure that evidence and science are driving decisions and not other um, uh, considerations. And finally, ethics, ensuring that ethical standards are upheld uh, in clinical trials, preventing um, any wrongdoing and safeguarding the rights of uh, people who do not have a voice. So I think that's those are the elements really on which this accelerator is based on. It's a wonderful partnership bringing together public sector, private sector, philanthropy, uh, as I said, and all these agencies that each have a mandate of their own. But really, you know, like for vaccines, it's Gavi, it's CEPI, it's WHO, it's the private sector, it's the developing country manufacturers, it's the innovator manufacturers. And it's only working like this together that we can actually achieve what the goal of this whole exercise is, and that is ending the pandemic. Right. It's a, it's a great initiative. And I think, uh, Thomas, I'm glad you're back just in time to, to say that IPMA is actually a founding partner of this initiative. And maybe you can explain um, the role of the biopharmaceutical research industry uh, in this whole global research effort and also its role in this WHO initiative. Thank you very much, Daphne. Actually, I had my panic button pushed, but I'm glad to be back in time uh, to, to rejoin. I think the role of the private sector is actually crucial and critical because we're all impacted by COVID-19, be it personally, be it in terms of knowing people who, you know, even have friends or family who lost their lives, be it economically. I think what's crucial is we will not come out of COVID-19, the pandemic, through lockdown, through social distancing. We will come out, as we heard from Sumia, through medicines, through testing, through developing a vaccine. And actually, the keys there are within IFBMA member companies. We do have a lot of collaboration between public and private sector, between academia, international organizations, philanthropic organizations. But when you look at the tests and the need to scaling up the tests, to have validated tests, when you look at the therapeutics, we have within four months of knowing about SARS-CoV-2, we have more than 145 therapeutic leads, repurposed medicines. We have more, as we heard from Zoomia, 100 vaccine candidates. But we don't have many companies in the world with the ability, with the know-how, the skill sets, uh, the ability to scale up manufacturing, uh, of uh, therapeutics or of vaccines, uh, it is basically within big multinational corporations. And there, what I saw in the response to COVID-19 is an unprecedented collaboration. It's an unprecedented reaching out to others, WHO, philanthropic organizations such as Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, international organizations such as Gavi, Seppi and others, because we do know that people around the world are keeping their fingers crossed that our scientists will come up with the therapeutics which help to, you know, improve the, blight, improve the chances of cure of patients, 
but at the end of the day with the vaccine, which will end COVID-19. What's important there, this is not just a scientific challenge. It is also an engineering challenge. It, it needs the ramping up of manufacturing. It needs the reaching out to others, for example, to share manufacturing capacity, to go into volunteer licensing. And it really needs collaboration across the board because no one will be able to solve COVID-19 on their own. We also have a deep sense of responsibility in terms of at the end of the day, we need to be driven by a common sense of purpose. And the common sense of purpose needs to include solidarity. It needs to include the global perspective and needs to include the issue of affordability because there is concern, understandable concern. At the end of the day, if you do find the medicine which works, if you do find hopefully the two or three vaccines which will work out of the 100 candidates, will they be available just to the people in the rich countries, in the industrialized countries? Will it be possible to leave no one behind? That's why I was very proud that on April 24, when Dr. Tedros hosted the launch conference of the call to action for the accelerators on vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics, IFBMA was a founding member and over the last four weeks, we have really been intimately involved at the table and we have committed to helping to end COVID-19. Back to you, Daphne. Okay, thank you, Thomas and Sunya. Well, I think we have heard from the both of you how important international collaboration is to get the results we want. What lessons do you think we can draw from COVID-19 to make sure that the global research ecosystem remains viable and ready to confront new challenges in the future? And also to ensure that all these vaccines and treatments actually do reach the right people. Is the WHO model initiative a good model for the future, for instance? Uh, how about you, Thomas? What are your thoughts on that? In terms of actually lessons learned from the first four months of uh, COVID-19, there are three which I would like to share. The first one is the importance of the sharing of the genetic sequences of the pathogen. It's the importance of an open access platform such as Cheesate. And it really reminds us of some of the problems in terms of when you look into international uh, treaties. Uh, I've written about uh, some of the flaws of the Nagoya Protocol. Uh, one of the real challenges and problems is I'm a believer in biodiversity. I personally, I believe in the importance of the Convention on Biodiversity, CBD. I haven't met anybody yet who wants to protect the diversity of pathogens. Therefore, the inclusion of pathogens in the Nagoya uh, protocol in the ABS is simply a mistake. And I think out of this, we were lucky because uh, SARS-CoV-2 was shared quickly. If you would have to spend four months, five months to negotiate material transfer agreements, honestly, that would be insane. And we need to look into this. Second issue is, I think we learned about the importance of resilient healthcare systems. Even in countries such as mine, Switzerland, we noticed at the beginning not sufficient masks available. When I look at the UK, the concern about you know, PPEs for healthcare workers. I think there we really need to improve on health system resilience. I was personally pleased to see, and we had regular interactions with Mariangela Shima from WHO on supply chains. Although we struggled a little bit in terms of close borders, in terms of temptations to be protectionist, by and large, our industry was able to maintain continuity of supply to a large extent. And the third uh, reflection which I wanted to share with you is, I think we also learned about the importance of a thriving, flourishing innovation ecosystem. We have seen just more recently the debate about IP and should do patents hinder uh, the fight against COVID-19 there. 
I would really strongly argue we would not be where we are in terms of the many, many repurposed medicines, the many vaccine suites, if we would not have a strong, flourishing innovation ecosystem, which is based on the protection of intellectual property. And one hope I have, and I see it actually right now fulfilled in the accelerator work, which was initiated by WHO, I do hope that we are able, and I'm looking at Sumia there, to break down the fencer hindrance. Uh, Dr. Tedros always talks about fencer being a framework. And as you know, Sumia, I occasionally joke and say, no, it's not a fence. It's actually a brick wall built by Tadao, a wall of concrete built by Tadao Ando, one of my favorite architects. And we really need to break down these walls and we need to make sure that the private sector is involved with due respect to conflict of interest. But when I look at the vaccines debate, which I've had for the last few weeks, everyone who is in there knows that we are crucial, our companies are crucial in terms of ending COVID-19. And there, I was really encouraged when we recently had a conversation with you and Dr. Tedros about the recognition and the acknowledgement of the importance of the private sector. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. And, uh, and Somya, uh, what uh, insights do you have? So I think what we've seen um, in the last couple of months is pretty amazing, and I would say pretty unprecedented. Um, at least I have never seen anything like this before, and a lot of people say this is the first time they're experiencing this huge sense of global solidarity and commitment that um, not just scientists and doctors and academics, but really people from all sectors. And I think maybe it's the realization that the way this virus has spread across the world, that nobody is going to be safe till everybody is safe. You know, so to a certain extent, you can think about protecting people close to you or around you or within your country's borders. But eventually, no country is an island and you can't stay as an island forever. And therefore, this realization that you have to find a solution that's going to ultimately protect everyone. And also, I think this huge outpouring of support for frontline workers, you know, frontline health workers and also other frontline workers, ones who undertake the day to day jobs that are putting themselves, you know, in harm's way. And many of them have sacrificed their lives. It's been so tragic to see the deaths of doctors and nurses and other frontline workers. And the only way we can protect these people, um, you know, given the shortage of PPEs and all of these things that we've seen, how supply chains have broken down, uh, even high income countries have not been able to, to, to get the stocks and to protect healthcare workers as much as they should have. So it's exposed weaknesses in the global system. It's exposed weaknesses within healthcare systems within supply chain networks, in the way that our laws and our rules operate, and in how much attention we've paid to preparing for pandemics. And you know, I want to quote Dr. Tedros as he talks about cycles of panic and neglect. We have been through panic before, Ebola, H1N1. We go then into a period of neglect. We talk about strengthening uh, preparedness. There's, there was this global health security uh, index that was put out, uh, you know, giving very high scores to a number of countries who today have seen the maximum number of deaths actually due to COVID. So what is that health security uh, index measuring? It, you know, I think all countries are now introspecting, looking to, uh, to see, you know, what went wrong and how can we prepare? Because for sure, this is not going to be the last pandemic. The other point I want to make is really that, um, also the point that Thomas was uh, alluding to is that uh, we have to find ways of working together, private sector, public sector, um, and get over the mistrust and the suspiciousness which each side has towards the other, put all those past differences aside. And, um, and you know, WHO um, under Dr. Tedros is, is, is a very different uh, organization very open um, to collaboration with all sectors. Uh, innovation 
has to come from the private sector. Without the private sector, we're not going to have drugs or vaccines. But at the same time, we have to ensure that um, not only have we, have we to develop these drugs and vaccines, but as I said at the beginning, that we have to ensure equitable access. Because what we don't want to see is that some people in the world get it and that large parts of the world don't get it. I mean, that's really not uh, the, the, the end result. And therefore, the accelerator um, has at its very core the basic principle of equitable access, which the president of the European uh, Union, Ursula von der Leyen, said during her speech. And uh, everybody's sort of come around that, um, uh, that principle uh, to work together. So I, I see that in this crisis, we've actually created a new way of working, um, setting, uh, perhaps, I hope, a precedent for the future to solve global problems through global solidarity. Well, thank you. We have quite a few questions now, and a few of them are related to what Sumia just said, basically about equitable distribution. We have a question about what would be the policies necessary to ensure sufficient vaccine coverage, and also whether the most efficient approved vaccines will be made available to all nations, and whether IFPMA and ICC propose to ensure benefit sharing after open access. So I'm not sure who would like to take that. Perhaps Thomas can take the IFPMA one, clearly. Please go ahead. Daphne, if, if I may, because it, it is pretty much about access. And of course, I know Asumia already addressed the importance. Uh, and, and it's also about access benefit sharing. Let, let me be really clear. We are committed to solidarity and we have talked about equitable, available and affordable. Therefore, we have this deep sense of mission in this in response to, to the pandemic crisis. Now, of course, we can't do this on our own. That's why we so much welcome the initiative which was launched with the call to action by Dr. Tedros with world leaders we support the Global Pledging Conference, because we can't do this on our own, but we are committed to equity. The second element, which I think is important, we also, and that's why this vaccine accelerated is so important, we do support a mechanism where the vaccines, out of the 120, I would expect you may have maximum 9 to 11, which make it to the next round, and then hopefully we will get two to three ready available next year. You need best science and you need industrial expertise because not every vaccine which looks good in the lab is scalable. And, uh, you can manufacture it in hundreds of millions of dosages. And last but not least, the question about benefit sharing. I think the best I can say is when it comes to pathogens is the benefit really has to be in making sure no one is left behind and people in low and middle income countries have access to what comes out of our labs. Okay, thank you, Thomas. We have a few questions about information. I think this is mostly for Sumia as it relates to WHO information. Does the WHO track people with early symptoms to be able to warn of future outbreaks in certain countries, as many countries don't have tests? And whether related to that, is it possible to have real-time or updated information about the findings on COVID-19 treatments? There is also a question on whether data from China is used because China managed to contain COVID in one province. Yeah, in fact, when China contained uh, COVID, the rest of the world was watching with amazement and saying, oh my God, you know, this cannot be done anywhere else. But then you saw country after country implementing um, the same lockdown that actually um, was done in, uh, in Wuhan and Hubei province and some of the other provinces in China. Um, and you see again now there's been, you know, uh, cases being reported again in Wuhan, in Jilin, and uh, they're going into a second phase of uh, lockdown, in fact, starting on this hugely ambitious exercise of testing every resident of Wuhan, 11 million people. You know, that's just, uh, it's amazing to even think about it. But 
I think this virus is not going to go away. It's really, when I don't think we can think about today eliminating this virus um, till we have this vaccine, until vaccine coverage is enough to protect, you know, to give this herd immunity so that there aren't too many susceptible people who can still catch it. But till then, um, these kind of stringent measures that have been put in place have resulted in a huge loss of livelihoods and huge impact on the economy. And the data that's coming from countries shows that the people who were already at the bottom of the economic ladder, the ones who had the least paying jobs, the ones who were in the unorganized sector, the ones who have the least amounts of education, who cannot do the kind of things we are doing now, working from home. And, uh, and those are the people who are going to be impacted. So I, what is really worrying me is the fact that inequalities and inequities in this world are going to be, are already being and are going to be aggravated. And the next couple of years, we've seen um, dire warnings of um, um, food insecurity, undernutrition growing, you know, increasing rates of tuberculosis. Uh, if we can't get our health systems functioning again, we're going to see deaths due to cancer, HIV, malaria, all going up. Um, and so we need to, I think, step back and take a more balanced approach because this virus isn't going anywhere. We've got to learn to live with it. We've got to be able to restart economies. People have to be able to earn and eat and, and earn a living. And people get other diseases which are not going anywhere. They need care. They need surgery. Um, health systems need to be able to function. That's the challenge now today. And this is where I think both the private sector and governments have a, the private sector has a huge role to play um, to take care of their employees, to take care of you know their own stakeholders, to ensure that they can they can provide safe uh, working environments as people start coming back to work. So WHO has put out these guidance documents both on workplaces as well as on schools and educational institutions as as countries are beginning to lift lockdowns. So then transport sector, you know, the airline industry, they, they, all of these will have to start doing business in a different way than what we've been used to. Uh, and also, I think about the environment, about places in the world which had the highest levels of pollution. And within a month, you find, you know, the levels of pollution have reduced so dramatically, uh, including in India, where I come from, including in China. Um, it, it, it means it can be done. All these years we've been talking about air pollution, climate change. Of course, this is a very drastic um, way in which it's happened. But it means that we have it in our control. So maybe when we restart lives, we should restart thinking about how can we live greener? How can we avoid unnecessary waste of resources, natural resources and other resources? And how can we protect the most vulnerable among us? And this is the time also, I think, for compassion, solidarity in science, but also, I think, solidarity in, in society. Indeed, very good lesson to draw. We also have a couple of questions relating to research. One about the status of the research of serological testing and whether vaccines based on different platforms have been tested in combination. That's a very good question and that's being discussed. And because these vaccine candidates are going to come at different times, in fact, that was WHO's proposal was to test them together. If you had two or three candidates, you could put them into one trial and do it head to head against a placebo. So that's still a, a proposal that we can discuss. But I have a feeling that some of the early candidates are going to go through their uh, their own uh, you know, placebo control uh, trials. And then we can think about, um, so there may be you know, different types of trials going on. On the serological tests, uh, I couldn't quite understand the question, but I think what uh, the tests we have now are telling us about uh, past exposure to the disease and the fact that you have antibodies only shows that you've had uh, exposure to the infection, doesn't tell us much about protection. Um, but what we have learned so far is that very small proportion of the population in most of these uh, countries like Spain and Italy and Germany United States. Uh, if you look at um, the number of people who were in hospital, you would think that this has swept through the whole population. But in fact, only five to ten percent of the population uh, is showing antibodies. 
that means that the large majority of people are still actually susceptible, have not had this uh, infection. So it's more an epidemiological tool right now. It doesn't really tell us much about individuals' um, protection. But we are learning more about the kinds of antibodies. And um, it's going to be important for vaccine development to, to understand more about the immune uh, mechanisms and the correlates of protection. OK, well, thank you. Then a couple of questions relating to regulation. Whether drug pricing regulation should be redesigned or the approval of the FDA and equivalent certification for vaccines and treatments should also somehow be accelerated. Maybe, Thomas, you can take that. The answer is fairly straightforward, no. Uh, it, we obviously right now are in a pandemic. We are exposed to a specific situation and there I think we have a deep sense of our responsibility towards the global community, towards citizens all over. And I think we are well equipped because we do have this flourishing innovation ecosystem. And if we want to be again well prepared for the next pandemic, I think we should be extremely careful not to jeopardize uh, this flourishing innovation ecosystem. What we are already doing in many countries is we are engaged in dialogue with governments in terms of how can we make sure that we are based, uh, have confronted with a reimbursement system based on outcomes, based on value. And I think that's an important element. Okay. Okay. We have a question about whether the experience with COVID should incentivize the establishment of a new legal framework for access and benefit sharing for pathogens under WHO, or whether the lesson is that we have improvised through this crisis so we will manage in the future and that we don't have to do anything but just carry on improvising. I can't answer that question just now, but I would just say watch this space. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's going to be an announcement by the Director General um, in response to the uh, request from the President of Costa Rica and, um, and so there's going to be an open call for a voluntary uh, pooling of all knowledge, resources, technologies, and IP related to COVID. And it, it depends on what the response is. It could be that this becomes a new norm for pandemics um, and that it gets built in, uh, but it's too early to say. But I think we, everyone seems to be really committed to sharing of uh, uh, knowledge and resources, at least for COVID-19. So, so yeah, so we watch this over the next couple of weeks and see, see uh, how many member states and, and, and how much of the private sector actually, you know, buys into this idea. I think, Daphne, if I may, uh, to mm -hmm. bring a little bit uh, life and uh, animated debate to it, I think there are two elements here because the question was about the experience with COVID-19 pathogen sharing. And there I go back to where Peter started. I think the importance of having rapid access to, to genetic sequence, to the sharing of pathogens is absolutely crucial. I do believe that the Nagoya protocol there is has flaws and therefore one really needs to look into it because it potentially could have hindered fast progress on tackling COVID-19. The other element is when I look into the framework, for example, for data sharing, knowledge sharing, we see it already happening. We do have a tool and a platform, for example, for volunteer licensing through the medicines patent pool. I think anything which seems to compromise or undermine protection of IP, even at the time of, uh, of pandemic, risk to jeopardize what we achieved right now, because that would send the wrong signal. Thank you, Sumi and Thomas. Would you like to leave us with one brief final remark before we close up? Uh, Daphne, from my side, uh, it's fairly straightforward. At the end of the day, science will win. I'm optimistic that we'll be able to defeat COVID-19. Sumia, one last word from you. I actually agree with uh, Thomas, and I, I do hope that science will win. 
not only for the development of new products, diagnostics, vaccines, but also in the way we, we manage this uh, infection in countries and the kind of uh, policies that are put in place. And, and again, I think using this crisis as an opportunity to make things that were broken, try and fix some of those other things. Thank you. It was great to finish on this very positive note of hope and learning for the future. We're sorry that we could not cover all the questions as our time is finishing, but we can try to answer them separately if we can. I would just like to thank all the speakers for taking time out of the incredibly, incredibly busy schedules. Thank you for sharing all your expertise, and I think we all learned an incredible amount. So thank you very much, and thank you to everybody for having listened in today. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for your time. So as a reminder, we are hosting live broadcasts on this topic, in addition to other trade topics like the Incoterms rules, cryptocurrency, leadership coaching, and many others. So sign up on our website for free and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of the COVID-19 Briefing. See you next time. Thank you.